For Antiwar.com and Chaos Radio 95.9 FM in Austin, Texas, I'm Scott Horton, and this is Antiwar Radio. Well, my friends, it looks like the establishment has given up on Iraq. The Central Intelligence Agency has just released a new national intelligence estimate. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations has just released a new report coming to pretty much the same conclusion that the cause is lost uh, to set up a new uh, multi-ethnic central state in uh, the land formerly known as Iraq. And uh, also it's been reported that the Pentagon has begun drawing up plans for uh, what to do after the eventual American defeat approximately a year from now, uh, according to their planning. In Iraq, 3,000 people were killed just last month. The U.S. casualty rate is the highest it's been since the spring of 2004 when the Army was fighting full-scale battles in Fallujah and Najaf at the same time. Uh, more than 3,000 American soldiers have been killed. Tens of thousands of them have been wounded. And a lot of Americans wonder, how the hell did we get into this mess? What happened? Well, my guest, Karen Katowski, had a front-row view, and she's here to explain what happened. Welcome to the show, Karen. Well, good to be here. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, I guess I ought to give you a little bit better introduction. Uh, Karen Katowski was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force, now retired. Uh, she worked at the uh, Near East South Asia desk at the Pentagon with a front-row view to the Office of Special Plans. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's right. For about uh, 10 or 11 months, uh, directly uh, working for Bill Ludy, who was also in charge of Abe Shulsky. So Abe's uh, Office of Special Plans was our sister organization. And for three months in the summer of 2002, uh, we actually shared office space. Uh, we were all together. So I got to uh, get to know, at least uh, superficially, uh, some of the folks that, that later constituted the Office of Special Plans. Of course, the topic of that, that IG report. Right, and now I guess that's my first question really is, did the inspector general come and interview you about what you witnessed there? Actually, they did. They did. Um, apparently, the uh, IG uh, was initiated, I think, at the request of some congressmen. I'm, I'm sure that's public knowledge, and I don't know which ones, but um, some of the guys in Congress who really felt that this was, uh, you know, needed to be looked into and that the Pentagon would not do it without being pushed, uh, asked for this investigation, I think about 14, 15 months ago. And last March, almost a year ago, uh, uh, several folks um, from the IG team working on this uh, question came out uh, to where I live, and we sat in McDonald's, a local McDonald's here in Woodstock, Virginia, and we sat there for about two and a half hours and uh, chatted. And I was actually, um, I was happy, of course, to, to participate. I was surprised that they'd waited four months to come and see me. I was extremely surprised at how ignorant they were of uh, how things work and even of names and things that had been widely published, not just by me, but by lots of investigative reporters by uh, 2006. I mean, lots of this information was out there, and yet they seemed very innocent, and I, I use that word uh, carefully, but they seemed very innocent of what was going on, and they explained their ignorance and their innocence to me by saying that members of the IG are picked purposely to be ignorant of what it is they're looking into. Sort of like I a jury. Kind of nutty, but okay. <laughs> That's what they told me. So, so they had a lot to learn, and I kind of insulted them at the end of our conversation, not on purpose, but I just said, look, I said, uh, uh, it is going to be uh, extremely difficult for you to uh, successfully and honestly do this, this uh, thing that you've been chartered to do, which is to find out uh, if this organization is producing... Uh, pseudo intelligence, presenting it as if it was real intelligence, and in doing so, uh, you know, accelerating or or gaining uh, an unnecessary and illegal war. It, it's going to be tough to do what you are going to have to do. And I don't. I told them I didn't think they'd be able to do it, and um, never heard from them again uh, until. And I still haven't, but of course, the, um, I haven't heard from them. But the report's out. The report's out. So um, I haven't seen it, but from what I hear and looking at the executive summary. Uh, they probably pushed as hard as they could, and I think um, uh, to their credit, to their credit, because uh, uh, even even the current policy guy, Ed Edelman, is, uh, was very uh, angry about this. So I think they must have worked really hard on it, and I, I give them credit for that. 
Well, did you get a load of Douglas Fife defending himself <laughs> over the I weekend? I got a load. I got a boatload of Douglas Fife. <laughs> well, he told the Washington Post that, hey, listen, all I did was critique intelligence, which oh, is perfectly okay, and uh, just because I submitted a report doesn't mean that I endorsed its substance. <laughs> That's right. And then later he goes on to say, and, and actually, I just, and didn't George Tennant say that? Did, I was just saying what George said. You know, oh, what a loser. But yes, he has a, um, it, it's funny. I think um, less than the words that Doug Fife is saying, and I've read several and listened to several of his um, uh, interviews uh, in the past several days since that IG report uh, came out, which said that he had uh, not done anything illegal, but had certainly in producing uh, uh, alternative uh, stories and presenting them as if they were substantiated, he did something very inappropriate, and, and certainly you would expect uh, actions to be taken just on that. Um, he was very angry, and he's been on the, the talk circuit defending himself, and um, it's really, I think it's telling. One is how quickly and how angrily uh, they are responding, and number two, that the best response they have is to put Doug Fife on public television. That's just insane. He does himself no favors, uh, and that's all they've got. That's all they've got to defend their story is to put Doug Fife on there where he can sputter and spit, uh, you know, and, and claim, you know, these circular arguments that, oh, well, I didn't do anything but what Congress is doing. I was just criticizing intelligence, you know. It's kind of crazy. I, I think the IG has, uh, has done its work. I think they have made uh, many people uh, that are involved in this very angry, and that's a good thing. And um, they've probably given the congressman some meat to uh, to chew on here as they go forth and find uh, ways to really uh, get to the bottom of it. Now, having said all that, it's 2007. <laughs> We've killed, I mean, I don't know how many innocent Iraqis are, are uh, displaced, uh, exited their country. Uh, dead, wounded, uh, starving to death, sick because of what we've done to their water system. You know, I mean, the, the studies go up to, I think, what, 650,000 Iraqis dead mm -hmm. in, uh, because of our actions. We've got all our Americans dead and wounded. We're not doing anything to take care of our poor guys coming back with no legs and arms and eyes. Um, you know. Or with the, the mental problems that they're the, coming the mental, back with. What mental problems? Yeah, that's the Army's answer. You know, what yeah. mental problems? You know, but yes, indeed. And, we're, and, and, I mean, think of the. Uh, anyway, right. it's no. nice, it's a little bit late, um, and not only that, if anyone goes back, and I went back to see what I had written in uh, 2003. Yeah, me too. And you did just, but I mean, just to see, because, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of old news now, in a way, and I look back to see it, and I'm like, man, it's been said, people, you know, <laughs> it, yeah, this I is mean, not truly. a revelation. Right, I mean, it, honestly, uh, you came out, you wrote the New Pentagon Papers for Salon, you mm -hmm. wrote in Rumsfeld's shop for yeah. the American Conservative, right. and, uh, for Night Raider first, newspapers. My first op-ed uh, came out right the very month that I retired, and I was free legally to speak, I guess you could say. And this is the beginning of the summer of 2003, right? That's Just right. after the That's war. Right. Yeah, and not only that, there were plenty of people. Uh, Antiwar.com has their archives, lots of your writers, um, lots of thinkers, lots of professors, lots of politicians. All said, even before, even in the summer of 2002, they saw what was going on and publicly articulated the problems. And nobody was listening. So... I'm, it's a mystery to me how we do these things. I mean, yeah. we have gone to war. We have destroyed a country. It is the, it, you know, we need to think of a symbol so we can say the country formerly known as Iraq. You know, let's do a right. Prince thing. Uh, yeah. We'll just design something. And, and uh, that's about how ludicrous it is. No, uh, you know, there's, there's no Iraq. Uh, Iran and, and the whole region is in disarray um, in part, in large part, because of uh, precisely what Doug Fife wanted to do, which was to... Uh, to, you know, get our troops in there. And, you know, we're not even talking about some of the important things that are going on today. Forget the dead people. We ought to be talking about that. We're not talking about those permanent military bases. What's right. that about? What's that about? You know, isn't that, isn't that, to me, that seems to be the real reason that we're there, to construct those bases, yeah, to, to shift to our forces. To move our troops north from Saudi Arabia to the next country up Absolutely, from there. Absolutely, because when the Saudis fall, just like Richard Pearl wrote in his little book, An End to Evil, Richard Pearl said, well, when the Saudi House of Saud falls, we'll just, from our bases in Iraq, go get their mm -hmm. oil. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll husband it. You know, we'll just take care of it. It's not about oil. We wouldn't do something like that. We just want to be, you know, paternalistic about the oil. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just wrong. It's just well, so wrong. And, and we're not talking 
uh, the, the Congress isn't even talking about, uh, you know, they're, they're worrying about 20,000 troops. How, how are we going to turn those bases over to Iraqis, and which Iraqis might we turn them over to? Right, I guess it just depends on where they're built. Well, sure. Do you know where they built? Are they all up in the north and the south near the oil they're, fields? They're scattered. You've got um, two in the central, one in the Kurdish land, I think, and then I think there's one in the south, a big one. Now, we have other bases, too, other facilities, mm -hmm. and we rebuilt and strengthened a lot of Sodom's uh, facilities. Um, I mean, we're just, I mean, if the, the Iraqis can see us for what we are, and here we are fussing about, um, did Doug Fights do something inappropriate? Well, of course <laughs> he did, and we knew it years ago. And uh, it's just frustrating. I, but I do, I do, I don't want to pick on the IG. I think they had a hard job, and it seems as if they, um, it seems as if that they rose to my challenge, <laughs> you yeah. know, to really try to do something uh, in the face of hostility within the Pentagon, and, and it seems like they might have done that. I well, hope that's a, that, I mean, that's a good thing, but it's certainly not enough. When you hear Seymour Hirsch say that eight or nine guys took this country to war, mm -hmm. does that sound right to you? Well, eight or nine guys, and they're lackeys in the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post and the Washington Times. I mean, yeah. Right, and MSNBC and Fox sure. News. and CNN. That's yeah. what it, it was. So it was eight or nine guys plus mm -hmm. everyone in news media plus in this a country. Harem. Eight or nine guys plus a harem of prostitutes in yeah. the news media. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and actually, I'm not a student of this, but it's possible that this is not actually abnormal, but this is how many wars work. <laughs> right. And this is just our time to witness it, or at least my time to witness it up close and personal in some ways. Uh, right. And now, to, you know, to, for the average person who may not know about this stuff in detail like this, I mean, what we're talking about, uh, what you talk about in, for example, your article for Salon, the, the Pentagon Papers, mm -hmm. you said Bill Ludi called General Zinni a traitor. Mm -hmm. for being yes, opposed to the war. Well, and yes, and did. Colin uh, well, Powell also. Sure, sure. Well, he didn't call them traitors until they did something about their opposition. As long as they were silently opposed, as long as they didn't get in the way, um, they were fine. But yeah, Zinni in November, late November, when he was uh, actually displaced, or, or uh, I don't know if he stepped down or was asked to step down, but he had been uh, President Bush's Middle East envoy uh, about the time that he ended that term of service as the Middle East envoy. Uh, he spoke out publicly, um, saying that, you know, this was a mad rush for no reason. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but basically critical of, of the kinds of things that Fife was doing and that uh, Wolf Witz and Rumsfeld were doing with this thing. Uh, that was the time where they, where Ludi, that's the time frame where Ludi calls him a traitor. And the same with, uh, with Powell in, in Powell's efforts to get them, as a good State Department guy might do, you know, get them to go back to the U.N. and get, uh, to try to replay maybe something that Powell probably remembered from from uh, 1990, you know, try to get the world on board so that we don't have to pay the cost of this thing. But um, they were very angry at him for successfully doing that. Now, when he was trying to do that, he wasn't a traitor. But when he succeeded, then he was enemy number one. Right. And, and now uh, this, this ought to be, I think, really telling for the audience that this is a, a pretty severe kind of little cabal that's taken over when somebody who, I guess not so much anymore ever since he went along with them, but up until this point, Colin Powell's one of the most celebrated American personalities. I mean, for, sure. th for them to be marginalizing a mm -hmm. guy with as much power and influence as him, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they must have really had something going on there. Well, um, uh, it's not clear where their power comes from, but, you know, you've, all, you've heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. Um, they certainly believed in themselves. I think they believed in the justness of uh, destroying Iraq. Um, you know, they believed in the justness of ex of changing our footprint, our military footprint, not through negotiations and treaties, but through force, which is what we've done. You know, there's no there's no uh, status of forces agreement between our our military uh, people in Iraq and any Iraqi government. There's no SOFA, and there's no agreement for those bases. Um, and that's exactly how we like it, because those agreements take years and lots of dollars to negotiate, and we don't want that. So, um, you know, they had they had an agenda, and they felt, I'm sure, that it was good for America. I'm I'm not sure also that, uh, given the background of these people, given their public statements, given the documents that Feist and Pearl and a lot of these guys have participated in, I'm not sure also that they weren't thinking about, uh, you know, uh, an agenda, uh, a Likudnik agenda. Now, that's, I mean, I, it's pretty clear that they were influenced by that and it's pretty clear that uh, Colin Powell was not influenced by that and this therefore that I don't know, could have been part of the problem but in any case uh, they believed in their cause uh, I don't think it's a sense I, I don't think it's real power that caused them to uh, 
pick on guys as well known and as well respected as Colin Powell or or Tony Zinni. I think it was just uh, arrogance and hubris that that caused them to do that. You know, they're like they're like a bully. You know, bullies aren't necessarily that strong, and they're certainly not very smart. But they act the part, and they intimidate people. And that's I think how how these guys operate. Um, but yeah, I mean they, they they're still in place. None have been fired. Uh, you've got you've got Wolfowitz over at the World Bank. I, Lord knows what he's doing over there. But but he's over there, and that that is uh, very much a reward position. So they must have some hook still into the White House. Certainly Cheney, but but even the White House because uh, they're in positions of uh, of honor, even though they are extremely dishonorable. And I think this IG report, you know, lays that out in just one more way. Now, besides uh, General Zinni and uh, General Powell, these guys also marginalize the career officers, the regular bureaucrats and, and you know, busybodies and, and so forth inside the Pentagon and their professional capacities, that they all got ran out or moved mm-hmm. to desks where they wouldn't really have much influence. Is this, yeah. is this Fife just bringing up questions about intelligence, of this part of that? Uh, well, I, I don't, you know, we haven't seen the complete report. But, um, but, but, yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that, uh, uh, well, at least from my perspective and what I saw, is that uh, if you were opposed to this, uh, to the neocon agenda in the Pentagon uh, or in Intel, you were going to be shunted off to the side. And I tell a story about one of the uh, DIA briefers, an SES, senior executive service guy, who was assigned to Bill Ludy to give him his intelligence in the whole region. And he had a staff of, of five or six people, uh, all trained intelligence people, uh, belonging to uh, Defense Intelligence Agency uh, at the back end call of, uh, of Bill Ludy for Middle East Intelligence. And what they told him was so disagreeable to uh, Bill Ludy, so inconsistent with the fantasy that they were all embracing, that um, when I arranged a trip, I was told either Bill Ludy will go or the DIA SES will go, but neither of them will go on the same trip because Bill Ludy will not set foot in the room with his own intelligence advisor. And this is this is a, a train, you know, I mean, a professional career intelligence guy at the uh, flag officer level. Um, but that was their attitude. So yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's like shunting them aside. Mm-hmm. You could you could debate what that's called, um, you know. But whatever it is, it's called not listening to the smart people who are trained to do their job and who are doing their job mm-hmm. because they're not telling you your fantasy. I mean, these these people are like, uh, you know, I mean, it, it would it'd be funny, but it seems like maybe we could. Uh, you know, take them in for counseling on some reality TV show, you know, and see what's wrong with them, these neocons. Uh, because they clearly have something that a psychologist or a psychiatrist could probably help with. But, um, but no, they were running, they were running the show. Uh, not grounded in reality at all. Um, making their own reality, as even, who's the famous guy, is it Rove or somebody who said, we make our own reality? Um, that's how they think, and that's what they were doing. And I think the IG has, to some extent, captured what they were doing. Um, again, too late to save any lives, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. I, I don't see how I don't see how this IG report can can be credited with uh, saving any lives. Well, if it helps get us out of Iraq any faster now, I guess that'd be a little that could bit. Be, yeah, if it helps, if it assists, if it gives uh, some fuel to some congressmen, if it gives some congressmen some backbone to stand up for what they know is right. It, it, or, or, I don't know, maybe not what they know it's right, but how about what 75, 80 percent of the Americans want yeah. them to do? Yeah, yeah what's yeah, politically that could be expedient? You know, politics. Yeah. Who, who knew democracy could work that way? Well, actually, it doesn't, but, you know, that'd be nice if they would listen to the American people. Um, and maybe this will help push them in that direction. Well, now, I you also hope. mentioned the Likud connection there that these guys have to the right wing parties in Israel. And there's an anecdote that you tell in your article, Open Door Policy, for the American mm-hmm. Conservative oh, yeah. Magazine. Mm-hmm about, uh, I guess, uh, supposedly escorting, but really chasing after some Israeli (laughs) generals who came to visit Doug Fife. That's right, yeah. And they barged in on him, too. I mean, it wasn't even as if they really respected him. They were like, you know, where's our boy? But that's just my observation. I mean, I saw it happen. I'm not the only one that saw it happen. Uh, We didn't have these folks sign in. They were were special. And that's okay. You know, it's good to be special. I'm all about being special. But... um, but not when, not when it gets people killed and not when it um, destroys our reputation and destroys whole countries, which, of course, is what we've done, and I think, and I think what we intended to do, really. I think we intended to put bases in there to facilitate further hegemony over oil and, and to uh, facilitate uh, a long-term strategy that Israel has had to, uh, 
make sure that nobody supports the Palestinians. And, of course, uh, since Saddam's gone, there is nobody really supporting him. He was the only one of the Arab leaders who stood up consistently and said, the Palestinians might have a case here. Why don't we listen to it? And, uh, you know, no, there's nobody doing that now. And you can be sure our little puppet in, in, uh, in uh, Baghdad's not doing that. Yeah, so do you think when, when Fife didn't bother coming up with a war plan, uh, that basically what he was hoping for was, at least if they couldn't get their Hashemite kingdom or Chalabi or something, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that plan B or C was to just go ahead and turn the country over to complete chaos? Well, you know, there never was a plan B or C written. Uh, what these neocons uh, in the Pentagon, what these uh, friends of Israel and, and uh, uh, certain other folks who were making our foreign policy, what they were thinking amongst themselves is not clear. It would certainly be the utmost of... Uh, not just illegal but immoral, you know, to actually propose that we're going to go create chaos. But if you think about it as a strategy, uh, certainly not unprecedented, um, certainly a very common strategy, um, in fact, even a common strategy among dictators. And perhaps like Putin said, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't know exactly what he said, but apparently he said that America kind of has overreached our bounds. He sees, I think Putin sees um, this country uh, as perceiving itself not as a global policeman, but as a global dictator. And if we are a dictator, then causing uh, our little subordinates to fuss and fight amongst themselves, to not trust each other, to, to, to be unable to develop any sense of community, much less nationalism, um, you know, hey, it's a good thing. Yeah, that's divide and conquer, the imperial divide strategy. Divide and conquer, you got it. Now, if you put divide and conquer in a war plan, as Plan B, we'll first we'll liberate and put our Hashemite kingdom in. Second, if that doesn't work, we'll divide and conquer. Well, you know, I don't know if that would sell. So, and I've never seen it written down that way. But um, I don't think. I guess what I can say is I don't think they're at all displeased. And if you look at Doug Feist's words, and I've been looking at what he's been saying, uh, he seems very pleased. Well, he's with the how guy that told Bremer. He's the guy that made Bremer, or I guess the two of them together decided to fire not just the Iraqi army, mm -hmm. but every single government employee who was mm -hmm. a member of the Ba'ath Party. Yeah. yeah, and you know, the thing is, when we debate what they were trying to do, when we try to figure it out, either it was by design, which is, of course, terribly immoral, um, or they didn't intend to do it, but they did it because they actually believed that if we fired all of the people that knew anything about Iraqi government, it would help their building of a new country. If that's true, then Tommy Franks is right, okay? And uh, Doug Feist is really the stupidest, you know, effing guy in the, in the planet. Uh, th that's what Tommy said. He, he's not right about a lot of things. Maybe he was right about this. And, and that would mean that they're innocent, but they're stupid. Now, I don't think they're stupid. So I tend to go with that they're, they probably, you know, wanted it this way. Um, well, Karen, not there's exactly, been a, but close. There's been a lot of drumbeat lately about the idea of spreading this war into Iran. Oh, sure. And I'm sure you know the forward has reported in the past that Michael Rubin, among others, huh. at the Office of Special Plans, even back in the days when you were there, mm -hmm. had already opened up a desk to work on Iran policy. And, of course, Larry yeah. Franklin... Larry Franklin, yeah. uh, And he was sitting in OSP. I mean, OSP included the Iran desk. Um, it, Iran was not kept separate. It was included in OSP along with the Iraq uh, So program. you were witness to that back in 2002, mm -hmm. that they were already working on Iran yep. there. Yep. Now, I don't know what their plans were, and Iran is a different kind of bird. They weren't um, passing around those kind of talking points about Iran like they did no, Iraq. No, there was, um, though, as you would find at the Ford and lots of other places, a lot of uh, uh, anxiety and contempt and uh, hatred for Iran, you know, a lot of uh, enemy-making, just the words. You know, the language has always been very anti-Iran. In fact, even in this country, since the um, Ayatollah, I mean, you know, this is an easy sell for Americans, unfortunately, because... Um, you know, a lot of people do remember. Uh, they don't remember when we set up our own guy in Iran years ago, but they do remember when Iran took back their country under the Ayatollah, under that, uh, you know, dictatorship of sorts. And so we have a lot of negative uh, images of Iran, and these are easy to, to fan up. You know, their embers are easy to uh, to turn into a big fire, and, and I think that's what uh, the intention is. And I, you know, I mean, come on. Bush has got how many more... Two years left, year and a half. Sure. Well, and we know also that Abe Sholsky is still working yeah, at the Abe's, OSP. Abe's, uh, Abe's in a position where uh, he can make some lessons from from any mistakes they might have made in Iran, or, or I'm sorry, in Iraq, and then apply uh, and then a make them propaganda program <laughs> yeah. for Iran. But but I mean we're already seeing that. I mean this whole idea of uh, of all these uh, 
uh, devices, the, exp the uh, improvised explosive device technology. Oh, Iran is sending it over. It, mo it can only come from Iran. Um, lots and lots of uh, interesting things, which which all point to uh, continued propaganda to expand this war. And and really, if you think about it, what are you going to do? You either have to leave Iraq, or you have to make it worse. Right. I mean, there's this no, is the... there's no middle point here. People are not going to American people are not going to put up with it, and the Congress knows it. They're not going to put up with uh, no change in plan. Something has to change. Now, the American people might get their soldiers back, and the neocon agenda will have uh, uh, at least be stopped for now. Or we can turn this into a bigger war, and the American people will very reliably fall into place. And I think that's what they're counting on. And, and certainly, look, think, this, the war, war makes money for a lot of people. Why not? Yeah, it costs yeah. the rest of us, but what take the on, hell? Take on Iran. Let's let them, you know, hey, if they bomb a couple of, uh, if, they, if they take out a couple carriers and battleships, what's wrong with that? We can build new ones. That's just $100 billion. Oh. Or more. Come well, on. That's a just, cynical just, 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 attitude. Just, no. Let's kill some more Americans and get Americans all hyped up, and then we'll consent to, to further things. It can just, it can be a, a rack redux. So I really think that that they don't care well, the, ne the, the neocons always meant for Iraq to merely be Act One, that, That's right. and they've been saying this whole time that, hey, mm -hmm. George, you have to do Iran too, or else the Iraq project yeah. doesn't work. It doesn't stand by itself. That's right. And also, um, if Iraq ends on a down note, on a failed note, which of course, as you started out with this, I mean, the, the military knows this is unsustainable, and it's going to be a failure. It is a failure now, and when it ends, it will be historically recorded as not just a failure, but, but a, a failure of the worst kind, one that was preventable. And um, so, so uh, they're telling George Bush, look, you know, yeah, yeah, you got reelected, Daddy didn't, but your legacy will be even worse than your father's if you don't complete this mission, which mm -hmm. is a neoconservative mission, which, which does include, I think, uh, something to do with, uh, with the destruction or the turmoil, increased turmoil in, in Iran. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that that's what they want to do. It just seems like it. And all the evidence points this way. The things you read point that way. And, and I, unfortunately, it'll be an easy sell for Americans because uh, many Americans, uh, ignorant as we are, have a negative view of, of Iran. Uh, from our own uh, watching of the news in the 70s and the 80s, we, we uh, associate Iran with uh, bad things. We expect bad things from them and uh, propagandizing us to uh, invade or attack or retaliate or defend ourselves against Iran will be an easy sell. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty sad, but I, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I kind of think that's where they're going. Um, unless, unless Congress can institute impeachment uh, against Cheney and Bush and, and some other officials. If, if the Congress could do that, I think they might be able to, uh, to stop it. Well, there's a great segue into my last question for you. You oh. enter, <laughs> you enter uh, article for Salon.com, the new Pentagon Papers by quoting Benjamin Franklin and his admonition that what they'd done was created a republic if we can keep it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I'd just like to give you a chance to kind of give that call to action to people out there to, to join in. You're fighting a good <laughs> fight, and how can they help, Karen? <laughs> I don't know, but I think the republic is, is, is being held on by a thin thread, um, but, but congressmen still respond to their constituents. And um, it seems that, you know, what we can do is we can, we can talk to them, we can march, and, uh, and not just on Saturdays, maybe on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Let's shut down Washington. I got this idea from, from uh, another guy who, who pointed out that all these, all these uh, protests are on the weekend. And, and that's not how it should be. And we need to communicate with the people uh, in the Congress. I mean, you know, the alternative is, of course, to overthrow the government or to let our government fail and we'll start over. Those are options, okay? I'm perfectly prepared for that. But um, I think, you know, the nice way to go about it would be to really communicate with whoever the representatives and congressmen are, uh, call them up, uh, go visit them, and talk to them about how you feel. And we don't want a war. We want this guy out of here. He's a, he's a corrupt criminal. Bush, Cheney, a number of people that they've appointed have broken laws, okay? They've, they have uh, gone against the Constitution, and that is uh, impeachment worthy. Um, we had a little practice with Clinton on some things that are impeachment worthy and it doesn't take much so uh... we, we should really proceed along those lines otherwise we can uh... prepare ourselves for uh... uh further death and destruction in the middle east uh... and for the loss of american lives and for the loss of our own liberties here i mean these are the choices so we can people can do what they want um, if it gets much worse i think i think our country is in big trouble and we, we, we may indeed get an opportunity to start over 
um, you know, there, there's nothing you can plan for that one. All right, everybody. Karen Katowski, she writes regularly for LouRockwell.com and MilitaryWeek.com. And um, please check out her articles. Career Officer, there's eye-opening stint in the Pentagon for Knight Ritter. The New Pentagon Papers for Salon.com. In Rumsfeld's Shop for the American Conservative Magazine. And Soldier for the Truth for LA Weekly. Thanks a lot, Karen. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Good talking to you.